Uh, good afternoon. So Welcome back to the Transportation Finance and Policy Conference Committee for this Tuesday, May 14th. Um, we will uh, have one major item of business, and that is to do a walkthrough of the housing portion of the uh, conference committee, and then we'll take a vote on the provisions as a package in their entirety. Is that correct, Mr. Chair? That's right, Chair Hornstein. I'd be happy to kind of make a few motions to get the get the bill before us. Okay, like. and then we can uh, do a, uh, a walkthrough with, with nonpartisan staff, if that's your preference or not. Yeah, that, that would be great. So I, I will move the A24-0342, which is our housing article. Um, and then we do have a technical amendment, Chair. Would it be appropriate just to move the technical amendment? Yes, is that the uh, A129? That'd be the A38, A138. Oh. Okay. Yes, I have that, the A. We have the A138 before us, and uh, the, Chair Howard is moving that. Um, so with that before us, I would turn it over to staff to walk through the bill. Chair, I you want to vote on the A138 now? Or? Sure. Okay. So this is a amendment to get the uh, bill in the shape the author would like us to consider. Uh, would you like to just briefly mention what this is that we're voting sure. on? Sure. Chair Hornstein, this is an amendment that clarifies some language um, that uh, the agency has supplied to us. Okay. Uh, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, the motion prevails. Okay. And um, we do have, just so everyone knows, um, Senators Morrison and McEwen are joining us remotely um, from Deep Haven and St. Paul, respectively. And we have our quorum we had this morning. We have again this afternoon. Thank, thank you, Chair Hornstein. Um, I'll just provide, I guess, a few introductory remarks and maybe Senator Port wants to as well, perhaps before we walk through in sure. greater detail. Um, but first, just want to uh, say immense gratitude to our staff, um, to Katrina Highmark, Justin Cope, our nonpartisan staff in particular, who I'm not sure if they've slept in the last several days um, preparing this. So just thank you to all of our staff and thank you to our Senate staff too. I'll let uh, Senator Port thank thank her staff as well. Um, this is an exciting article. It's an exciting housing bill. It focuses on housing stability for Minnesotans. We, last year, of course, had a historic housing bill um, to build more homes of all types all across the state, across the spectrum of housing. Um, and this year, we really focused with a more limited target on the more acute challenges facing Minnesotans. How do we prevent homelessness? How do we keep people safe and stable in their homes, knowing that despite our big investment, the needs are immense, the needs are growing. And so uh, we prioritize emergency rental assistance, we prioritize building more homes through housing infrastructure bonds, and we prioritize uh, preserving existing affordable housing that's at risk and where Minnesotans are at risk of losing their homes. Th th those are key priorities and tenants in a bill, um, both investments and policy that really build on our great work of last session. I want to thank Chair Port for her partnership all along the way this session. I want to thank Commissioner Ho and her team for their partnership um, in, in putting together and working on this package. And thank the Minnesotans and advocates that came to the Capitol advocating for a Minnesota where everyone has a place called home. And this bill uh, is another step in that direction. I'll turn it over to Chair Port. Okay. Uh the report is here, great. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you as well to Chair Howard. Uh, we have a wonderful housing team between the House and the Senate because we do work together, um, always right from the start. So um, thank you to, to nonpartisan staff on my side, uh, Dan and Laura, who have done tremendous work, as well as uh, Davin and Courtney. Um, 
these bills obviously are a ton of work and the, the time and effort that staff puts into it is incredible. I think, you know, Chair Howard really walked through um, the majority of the funding uh, proposals in our bill, but we do have a number of uh, studies and sort of pilot projects. Um, in this bill, we take some of the first recommendations from the work group on expediting rental assistance, uh, which Chair Howard and I were both on over the interim. We take the first steps to move that, uh, those recommendations through both DHS and uh, MHFA to start in increasing the speed with which we respond to folks in crisis. Um, we also uh, move forward the retroactive evictions expungement fix uh, which ensures that folks don't have to wait for that fix. It gives the Supreme Court the resources in order to do that right away. Um, we also have a task force on HOA and uh, community interest communities, um, as well as a single stair report, which is a reform that we are looking at uh, for smaller footprint apartment buildings. Uh, that have become popular in other communities to ensure that they could safely uh, also become an opportunity here in Minnesota. Um, overall, I'm really proud of the work that we did on this bill. I want to thank the commissioner and everyone at the agency. Um, and Mr. Chair, I think we could turn it over to staff then for a quick walkthrough. Thank you so much, Chair Port. And thank you. I want to personally thank you for all of your great work as well as uh, Chair Howard, very, very impressive. Um, with that, um, I don't know which uh, which staffer wants to go first. Okay, that'd be great, Mr. Cook. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, um, I will go through the spreadsheet that should be enclosed in your uh, packet. Um, I'm Dan Mueller. I'm the fiscal analyst for the Housing Committee. Um, the spreadsheet. Is titled uh, Conference Committee Report Housing Finance Policy. There are columns that show the House, Senate, and then I'll be working off the conference columns um, at the, on the right side of the page. Um, just before the conference committee had a, a target of $10 million uh, for fiscal year 24 25, and the, the way it is accomplished in this uh, proposal is there are You'll see on line four, there's a total of $18 million of reductions from fiscal year 24 appropriations, and then there's $28 million of sort of new reappropriations. So that nets out to the 10. And then there's a $1 million in the tails that um, will be used for paying the debt service on housing infrastructure bonds. So going into this, both sides had $50 million set aside for housing affordability preservation, which was a recapitalization program. And that was down on line 18 in both the House and the Senate. And the way this proposal is structured, it moves that proposal under the community stabilization program. So I'll walk through the changes to how that is funded now under that program and what reductions are taking place to fund that. Um, the first one on line seven, homeless family homeless and prevention assistance program was in both bills uh, at over $8 million. The final amount is $8.109 million. And this gets added to the 10.3 million that's currently already in the base for fiscal year 25. The next item on line nine, this is a, a new reallocation that will be used to pay for the, the community stabilization program. It is a $15 million reduction to supportive housing program that was funded in last year's budget bill. It was at $25 million. So now it is, uh, with a $15 million reduction, there will now be 10 million in that program. The next reallocation is in the housing challenge program. Um, this is a $7 million reduction to that. Um, it was funded in last year's bill for fiscal year 25 at 60, a little over $60 million. So there'll be um, about 50, a little over $53 million in fiscal year 25 for that program. Then the last reallocation 
that is in um, this proposal is on line 11 is a $3 million reduction to the workforce home ownership program. And that again was funded in last year's budget bill at $20.25 million. So it's down to 17. Um, so then you see on line 12 is the reallocations were added. They end up being $25 million get, gets added to community stabilization, brings that total for that funding program now up to $115 million. And then now the next lines are all allocations under that $115 million. So there'll be $50 million for community stabilization, which is a recapitalization effort. And within that $50 million, there's $15 million set aside for recapitalizations of supportive housing um, projects. The Wilder Senior Housing Rehabilitation is now a carve out under community stabilization at $3.25 million. The singles, and then there are two other set asides within um, community stabilization, $10 million for single family um, natural occurring, occurring affordable housing, and then $41.75 million for a multi-unit natural occurring housing. So those are the changes within housing finance agencies programs um, that are occurring within this proposal. And I'll turn it over to Katrina for the next part. Uh, Mr. Chair and members, Katrina Highmark, um, House Fiscal Analyst. I'll be um, <clears throat> talking about the items on the spreadsheet from lines 21 to lines 35. Lines 21 through lines 25 um, deal with implementation or um, proposals of working groups and studies. Line 22 is the implementation of the working group on emergency rental assistance that um, Senator Port mentioned in her, um, her opening comments. There is an appropriation of $471,000 in fiscal 24 and 25 um, to Minnesota Housing Finance Agency. On line 23, there's a grant to the Wilder Foundation for their Minnesota Homeless Study, um, which is a $100,000 grant, also um, to be distributed via um, Minnesota Housing Finance. Lines 24 and 25 deal with working groups. Um, that will be managed by the LCC. The first on line 24 is a working group on common interest communities and homeowners associations, which has an appropriation of $200,000 in fiscal 24 and 25. And line 25 is a long-term affordable housing working group that also has an appropriation of $200,000 in fiscal 24 and 25. Moving on to appropriations for other agencies on lines on line 28, there's an appropriation to the judiciary for retroactive eviction expungements of $545,000 in fiscal 25. Line 29 has an appropriation to the Department of Labor and Industry for single egress stairway apartment building report of $225,000. And on line 30, there's an appropriation to the Department of Human Services for transgender emergency shelter needs analysis. Um, of $150,000. Moving to the last um, four lines of the spreadsheet, lines 32 through line 35, um, are the housing infrastructure bonds. This is a total of 50 million in housing infrastructure bonds. Um, the bond payments for these bonds begin in fiscal 27. And um, that initial payment is 1 million in fiscal 27. And these bonds will have a cost of 2.8 million in fiscal 28 and 4.0 million in fiscal 29 and ongoing for the life of the bonds. And that, Mr. Chair, concludes um, the overview of the spreadsheet. Thank you. Members, are there any questions for um, Ms. Heimart or Mr. Bueller on the spreadsheet? Uh, Representative Petersburg. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and I, are we going to go through some of these sections as well, or, or is this covering pretty much all? Well, we'll also have uh, policy. Uh, okay, because I, I have a, sec a question about uh, Section 6 as well. We'll talk about that. Okay. Uh, Chair Howard, did you have any, uh, or Chair Port, any other comments? Why don't we uh, then go through the policy uh, pieces of the, of the bill. 
Um, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Justin Cope, House Research. I'll be starting the walkthrough of the policy items. Uh, turning to the A24-0342 amendment, I'm starting on page 8, which is the housing policy article. Section 1 removes a reporting requirement uh, for MHFA to report on amounts uh, deposited to the housing trust fund from the interest from real estate brokers accounts. On page 9, section 2 modifies a provision allowing Hennepin County to set aside uh, certain contracts for entities that employ persons who would be eligible for public assistance or rehabilitative services. Turning to page 10, sections 4 uh, through 10, each modify provisions governing Minnesota Housing Finance Agency, pro agency programs relating to energy conservation. Uh, this is similar to language that was carried in the agency's policy bill with the exception that the policy bill had stricken reference to conservation uh, in favor of language for uh, decarbonization, climate resilience, and energy, and this language reinstates conservation and adds it to a list that includes uh, those other purposes, decarbonization, uh, green energy, and climate resilience. Turning to section 11, which begins on, um, excuse me, page 15 of the A24-0342. Section 11 modifies a provision enacted last year that makes Indian tribes eligible for agency funding so that they'd be eligible for uh, programs enacted in session law as opposed to programs only enacted in statute. Section 12 allows Minnesota Housing Finance Agency to modify its programs so that their uh, rent or income limits align with federal program rent and income limits. Section 13. Uh, imposes a reporting requirement on the Minnesota Housing Finance Agency that they report for every competitive grant program uh, from laws 2023 and thereafter on the, the uh, requests for funding and the amounts awarded. Section 14, which is on page 16 of the amendment, uh, allows MHFA to deem and, uh, households as being eligible for their programs if those households are receiving certain uh, means-tested public assistance benefits. Uh, section 15, like sections 4 through 10, is another one of the um, provisions modifying uh, energy utilization and uh, adds decarbonization and climate resiliency to certain provisions for uh, climate programs with the agency. Section 16 on page 17 raises the agency debt ceiling for general obligation bonds from $5 billion to $9 billion. Section 17 uh, allows MHFA rather than MMB to pay itself uh, administrative costs from the Minnesota How uh, Manufactured Housing um, relocation trust fund. This conforms to a uh, change in last year that transferred authority for the trust fund from MMB to MHFA. Section, section 18 modifies the allowable uses of housing infrastructure bonds to uh, expand uses for supportive services provisions uh, to allow abandoned and foreclosed property to be used for affordable home ownership, to allow housing infrastructure bonds to be used for uh, cooperative housing, and finally, to clarify what is meant by a requirement for um, accessible units being required to be uh, constructed when um, new buildings are constructed with housing infrastructure bonds. Turning to page 20, section 19 authorizes the agency to issue $50 billion in new housing infrastructure bonds. Section 20 requires uh, MMB to transfer the amount to MHFA to pay uh, the debt service on those housing infrastructure bonds. On page 22, uh, there's a set aside removed from the workforce development uh, program. And then section 22 amends the Greater Minnesota Housing Infrastructure Grant Program to add counties to the uh, list of eligible entities and to allow use of the program for 
manufactured home park infrastructure. On page 24, section 23 removes a set aside from the Minnesota uh, tax credit contribution account program. And section 24 uh, modifies, modifies the provisions governing the use of that program to make certain entities that would have previously been disqualified eligible for the program to make the same standards that apply to loans under the program apply also to grants and allow MHFA to rely on applicants for funding uh, self-attestations as to their eligibility when determining whether or not they're eligible for funding. And section 25 on page 26 modifies provisions governing the Met Council's development guide to provide that um, decisions to adopt or authorize a comprehensive plan are not subject to the chapter of law governing the state's environmental policy. And with that, I turn it to my Senate counterpart, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair and members, for the record, my name is Laura Painter. I'm an analyst for the Senate. Section 26 through 30, um, starting on page 27, expands local affordable housing aid to include supportive housing and requires aid recipients to use the money to supplement rather than supplant locally funded housing expenditures. Sections 31 through 35, starting on page 33, expand the state affordable housing aid in a similar way. Section 36 on page 40 prohibits landlords from discriminating against a tenant or prospective tenant due to a tenant or prospective tenant receiving rental assistance. Section 37 expands the allowable use of funds for an appropriation made in last year's session law to the Northland Foundation. Sections 38 through 43 amend the Community Stabilization Program to include support for recapitalization of distressed buildings. You can see how those terms are defined on pages 41 and 42. And so the other changes um, in section 40 include those uses. And then there's some requirements for private lender participation in section 42 and also a report on, in section 43 on page 43. Section 44 amends the first time home buyer fee-based home purchase financing program. Um, the definition of the eligible home buyer is amended. Section 45 on page 44 clarifies an effective date relating to expungement of eviction records. Section 46 requires the Commissioner of Labor and Industry to evaluate the safety of single egress stairway apartment buildings and report to the legislature. Section 47 requires the Commissioner of the Housing Finance Agency to report on locally funded housing expenditures, the reports that are new requirements in this bill in the housing aid sections. Section 48 on page 45 creates a work group to study common interest communities and homeowners associations and to report back to the legislature. Section 49 establishes a task force to study long-term sustainability of affordable housing and requires them to report back to the legislature. Section 50 requires the Commissioner of Housing Finance Agency to prepare a report on senior renters residing in properties financed through tax credits. Section 51 exempts comprehensive plans from being challenged <coughs> under the Minnesota Environmental Rights Act. Section 52 corrects a codification error made in last year's session law. 53 has some repealers. Paragraph A repeals a reporting requirement for the home ownership education, counseling, and training program. And paragraph B repeals a purpose statement for, from the local affordable housing aid. Moving on to page 52, article 14 relates to the, the recommendations from the work group on expediting rental assistance. Section one requires the Housing Finance Agency to develop a projection of emergency rental assistance needs every year and to report on the projected need to, to the legislature. 
Section two requires the housing finance agency to ensure their work is culturally responsive and trauma informed for this, um, this article. Section three requires the agency to work with the Commissioner of Human Services to develop criteria for measuring the timeliness of processing applications for rental assistance and to use the collected data to inform improvements. Section four requires the Housing Finance Agency to develop uniform e-signature options to be used in applications for the Family Homelessness Prevention and Assistance Program. And section five requires the Housing Finance Agency to develop recommendations to simplify the process of verifying information in applications for the Family Homelessness <coughs> Prevention and Assistance Program. And that concludes the walkthrough. Thank you so much for your excellent work. Um, we'll now revert back to questions from the committee, and I think that uh, Representative Petersburg had a question. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and I maybe should have asked it during the finance portion because it does refer to page three uh, in regards to 3.33 uh, uh, onto the next page. The $150,000, I don't remember hearing it in the House um, Committee, uh, in, in the House Housing Committee. And so I'm just trying to get some information as to where did that come from, what was the impetus for it, what was the rationale for adding it in, because I don't think it was in either bill. So, uh, members, uh, I think that uh, Representative Petersburg is referring to Section 6, Human Services. Is that correct? Uh, uh, Section Chair 6, Howard. Human Services on 3.32 of the... Okay. Uh, Chair Howard. Uh, Chair Hornsing, Representative Petersburg. <clears throat> this is a provision that was heard in the Children and Families Bill and debated on the floor. Um, it's a Representative Finke provision, and this provision adds resources. There's, uh, there's also 150000 carried in the Children and Families Bill um, to get this funding to a level to, to accomplish the stated goal. Um, which is to contract with Propel Nonprofit to study the creation of a homeless shelter for the transgender community. Representative Petersburg. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for, for that understanding of where it, it comes from. Uh, I do have uh, only just minor concerns in which we start picking apart various groups of people that are dealing with homelessness uh, when we have an obligation to everybody equally the same. And so, uh, you know, how many more other groups will determine that it's necessary to study their particular uh, situation versus that? So, you know, that, that's a concern with that. Uh, when we're ready for some more amendments, I might have more discussion too, Mr. Chair. Yeah. Chair Howard. Uh, Chair Arnstein, uh, Robert Spears, I just wanted to, to mention that um, we've heard from members of our transgender community that uh, feel unsafe uh, in current shelters. And that leads to uh, folks in our community, you know, not having any place to be. I think there are unique challenges that uh, require kind of looking at this, and I'm glad that uh, we are looking at it. And I want to thank Representative Finke for for her work on this bill. I believe, and I believe it's a Senator Dibble bill as well in the Senate. No, okay. Try to give you credit there, Senator. Wish I could take it. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. Are there any other uh, follow-up, Representative Peterson? Uh, uh, thank you. There was one other question. I was trying to find it right away, and that had to do with uh, Section 51 of uh, the Comprehensive Class Metropolitan Area Cities of the First Class. Could could somebody explain exactly what this does? Because it seems like we may be letting Met Council in Minneapolis um, off of some responsibility there, but I'm not sure if I fully understand that paragraph. Be page 51 starting with 51.10. Chair Howard. Uh, Chair Hornstein, Representative Petersburg. Uh, this is a bill that was uh, carried and passed in our state government bill um, and heard through committees in both the House and the Senate. Uh, this is related to um, uh, litigation uh, that threatens cities' ability to do their comp planning process in a way that makes sense. And what this language would do specifically would say that for cities of the first class, uh, their existing comp plans are not subject to, um, to MIRA, the, the Minnesota Environmental Review Act. I would note that uh, in statute, comp plans have to, uh, by Met Council, uh, under statute, have to meet all kinds of uh, environmental considerations in terms of climate considerations, water considerations, et cetera. 
Um, and, but we think this is appropriate. It will uh, help end uh, a lawsuit that has been uh, threatening the ability to build homes in Minneapolis um, and threatens all of our city's uh, ability to, to do comp planning in a way that makes sense for their communities and their citizens. Thank you, Representative Petersburg. Uh, thank you. Again, this is a, probably the second piece that was put in that's in actually in other bills as well, uh, bringing forward. And I've heard a little bit of a concern about this, and I'm not sure whether or not there's some somebody that wants to testify in regards to this area or not, but it's, it seems to me that it's concerning when we start taking away responsibilities for following with plans and saying you're no longer in violation when you don't follow the plans that you have. It seems like that's pretty a, a important for us to, to hear more about. And I, so I don't know, Mr. Chair, it's up to you whether or not there's, there's anybody here that <coughs> could speak to this. Otherwise, we need to move on. Mr. Howard. Just quickly, Chair Hernstein. Uh, thank you, Mr. Peter. If we did open up testimony, I think we would just see a parade of people supporting this yeah. language. I would note that um, all of the city organizations support this bill. A myriad of environmental groups support this bill because they believe this is the right policy for environment. Um, and both for-profit and non-profit housing folks support this bill. So we've worked on this language. It's broadly supported. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. I would concur with... Uh, Chair Howard's assessment of the public testimony where that would fall. Okay, uh, Senator Limmer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I uh, noticed in on page 8, Article 13, Section 1, uh, we're striking language requiring a report to MHFA, and I believe... Um, this was not in either the House or Senate bills. I was wondering uh, why it's now surfacing here in this particular bill. Could someone answer that? Hey there, Chair. Uh, <coughs> Chair thank Porter. you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Senator Limmer. Uh, this was a request from the agency to add this, but it is because it is really a duplicative report that is uh, created in several of their other reports that they provide to the chairs and uh, to the public. So, Mr. Chair, Senator Lemmer. Senator Port, um, is this an itemized report or is it part of a, a larger report that goes to MHFA? Uh, this is a report that they previously had given just directly to the chairs uh, that was, I, I don't know if I'd go so far to say itemized as sort of categorized maybe, um, but similar information uh, exists in other reports that they provide already. Uh, Ms. Chair. Uh, Senator Lemmer. Uh, the reason I raised the question was it was talking about amount of funds deposited in the housing trust fund account and when the requirement of a report was stricken, I was kind of wondering why it raises, always raises my question about that. If it's in an existing report somewhere that they get, then my uh, concern is alleviated. Uh, and I'll go from there. Was this uh, just a late request from MHFA? It was. To squeeze it into this bill? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Limmer. Thank you, Chair Port. Uh, is there any other member? Questions, Senator Lever. Mr. Chair, if I could rush you over to page 44, uh, section 47, uh, locally funded housing expenditure report. I guess I'm focusing on where the money goes. <laughs> and um, uh, I believe this report is a one-time report, but it's an ongoing expenditure that's required. I was just wondering why this is on 40, section 47, article 13. Um, if it's an ongoing program, why would we only have an expenditure report on the first year and not continue? Either of the chairs. Uh, we're looking at uh, 44.28. 44.28. Section 47, locally funded housing expenditure report. Pay, that's the very bottom of page 44. Funding program. Uh, the state. Do you want to just answer that? 
Chair Howard. Thank you, uh, Chair Hornstein. So this is related to the changes we made with our uh, uh, the metro sales tax and the local housing aid. Um, we asked uh, the uh, this new language about uh, cities and counties should supplement, not supplant, existing resources. And one thing that the cities and counties came to us with the request is, could we sunset this? Um, we're not sure that um, this reporting will need to be in, in perpetuity. Um, and we weren't comfortable with the sunset, but we were comfortable with creating a study a few years out to sort of assess um, how this law is working so that we have an opportunity as a legislature to decide if uh, we could sunset this or we want to sunset this. Well, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mayor Lemmer. Uh, oh, I see the, the report is out to 27. I get it. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Any other, uh, other good questions that folks are raising? So, any any other Senator Port Chair Port? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, members, I, I think if we sort of ground ourselves in this commit, the work this committee has done, um, the number that keep keeps coming back to me and has stood out to me all session is that on any given night in Minnesota, more than 8,000 Minnesotans, uh, an, increase, an increasing number of that is seniors and families with children are homeless. They have no place to go. Um, and this crisis is growing in Minnesota and fully half of our families across the state are cost burdened for rent and housing is becoming unaffordable for an unprecedented amount of Minnesotans. This housing shortage is most deeply felt uh, by vulnerable families and over 80% of low income families are currently cost burdened for rent. In light of this crisis, we really have a responsibility um, to ensure that whatever available housing choice vouchers or other public assistance that families can find is able to be used to secure safe and affordable housing and doing any less is simply unacceptable. The impacts of homelessness and housing instability are devastating and we heard this year from families who've spent months sleeping in their cars with children in addition to the many ways that homelessness hurts education, healthcare, and employment outcomes. Fewer than one in four eligible individual families receiving housing choice vouchers, and those are the lucky ones who get a voucher after years and years of waiting. Nearly one in four of them are unable to find a housing opportunity that will accept it. Source of income protection, which 20 states have already adopted, would help to ensure that every step that we take to support families in existing homelessness, in exiting homelessness, and in finding stable housing is used more effectively and helps us move closer to permanently ending family homelessness in Minnesota. We have a long way to go to fully fund the needs of housing for our state, but as we dedicate unprecedented levels of funding towards building new homes, we cannot turn our eyes away from those families that are in crisis. We need to do everything in our power to make sure that the state and federal resources that we're dedicating to help vulnerable Minnesotans aren't wasted, especially through discrimination. Passing source of income protections would accomplish that goal by increasing voucher utilization rates and by helping decrease housing segregation throughout the state. Unfortunately, the Senate does not have the votes to pass this provision and to protect against discrimination. I will not hide my disappointment in that fact, Mr. Chair, uh, and it is with great disappointment that I offer the A129. Hey, the A129 is before us, and uh, members, that involves the leading section 36 on uh, page 40. And I think that uh, Chair Port did explain the rationale for this amendment. Is there a discussion? Yes, uh, Chair Howard. Uh, Chair Hornstein, uh, Senator Port, uh, I want to share and the deep disappointment that this provision is coming out. It's a provision that Minnesotans have been asking for and advocates have been working for for, I mean, I think uh, almost a decade. It, it's 
uh, been a part of the discussion every year. I've been here at the legislature. Um, and you know, near the end of session, uh, bills and priorities, uh, sometimes they, they die, right? And every legislator in this body, it's their prerogative to, to decide how they're gonna vote on an issue. Uh, but I think it's the, uh, also that should be the public's prerogative to understand um, why something so important uh, like the uh, basic rights for our low-income renters, why that is not moving forward. And so I think it's important for the public to know that the reason this bill isn't moving forward is because the Senate Judiciary Chair, Senator Latz, has informed us that he would vote against this entire transportation, housing, and labor bill if this provision is in our bill. And that is beyond disappointing that one member of this legislature would uh, seek to take down all of the fine work of all of the members, all of the Minnesotans that have done work in housing and labor um, and transportation in this bill. Um, but we can't in good conscience put all of that good work at risk. That's some, not something that we are willing to do, um, which is why I have to support this amendment. But I think it's important for the public to understand why things happen and why things don't happen here in this legislature. And I thought it was important to get that on the record before we took this vote. Thank you for that. Uh, Representative Petersburg. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And I, I guess I'm not going to be quite as um, poignant as that, but I think it, this is another representation of when some individuals, uh, and I think all of us should be more in this line, when we start thinking about the overall uh, ramifications that goes beyond a, any particular area. Because of the committee structure that we have in the legislature, we have a tendency to think only within those silos about what, what we'd like to do with it. And yet, almost all those silos have connections with others that impact it. Uh, for example, um, uh, rent costs and so forth isn't just strictly about housing. It's also about uh, average incomes and all the other things that have to do with it because um, most of the rents are, are, whether we like it or not, have a tendency to be at least somewhat connected into the average wages around and, and the availability of it. Then we talk about the uh, shortage of houses and whether or not that has an in indication of the supply and demand. And so sometimes we, we try to fix one particular area without understanding the full ramifications. In the Section 8 area, I think there's also a, a concern about how uh, uh, this particular language had impacts beyond just the housing area and what it might do to um, asset management and other things going on. And so uh, we can be disappointed that this doesn't get in, but I think we also need to be realistic that there are a lot of other things playing into this rather than just housing and whether or not we can find people, people homes, which is always all of our goals. So I, I just wanted to share that because I, I won't be able to share with that next year. Uh, but, but I think it's important for us to always understand that no, one, no area is a microcosm upon itself. It is impacted by a lot of other things. And sometimes we don't always see that. Thank you, uh, Representative Petersburg. Is there any further discussion to the uh, A129 amendment? Chair Dibble. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to um, also express my disappointment um, uh, that uh, this uh, you know, provision that uh, guards against discrimination against people who are trying to find housing based on their source of income. Um, I think uh, that was an exciting aspect, uh, and I think it's an advance on behalf of you know recognizing uh, those some in this body don't agree that it's a human right. I happen to think it's a, a human right and a fundamental responsibility of ours. Um, and of course, we're talking about folks who are in need of housing in our, you know, this comprehensive package and this this movement and this initiative started a number of years ago and has really uh, has really taken hold here and represented by the amazing work uh, last year of our two chairs. And this is the next step. Um, and so I just uh, really regret. Um, that uh, a number of people who we could have the opportunity to help whose lives would be improved and would be better won't be reached now. Um, 
with removing this form of discrimination that is very active in the housing market and, um, and uh, will be turned away from a place to call home. And so I regret to support um, the chair's initiative in taking a, you know, a responsible <laughs> step to protect the rest of the package and all the important work that Representative Howard articulated, but this is regrettable. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Chair Dibble, and I would uh, concur with your comments as well. Um, is there any um, anyone else that would like to weigh in on the A129 amendment? Okay, members, then we will uh, take a vote. Uh, all those in favor of the A129 signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, the motion prevails. Okay, so we have our uh, housing conference committee report as amended before us. Uh, further discussion, Representative Petersburg. Uh, Mr. Chair, if I could, I'd, I'd like to also do just a, a, a verbal or an oral amendment, if possible, and that's up to you to accept it, but it would be on page 17 in regards to the raising of the debt ceiling from $5 billion to $9 billion. And my, my amendment would simply put it back to what the House language was, which was seven billion dollars, and and if I could explain the rationale for that amendment, I'd, I'd be willing to do that. Now. Okay, let's just um, make sure everybody's literally on the same page here. Um. Seventeen point six, line six. Okay, I see that, um, and I will uh, allow for this oral amendment to be considered and. Once you laid your case, we'll have uh, nonpartisan research. Okay. Repeat the uh, amendment so we can vote on it. Represent Petersburg. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And the rationale for that is that uh, we had a fairly extensive debate in the Housing Committee in regards to going from $5 billion to $7 billion, which is at that point is still a 40% increase in that debt ceiling. And the concern with uh, how much money that we're allowing for for debt and I understand that if we go larger it will carry more into the future except that whenever we put government on autopilot we take away some of the uh, authority and responsibility of this legislature on on determining what that limit is and this is is debt that uh, it is geo bonds but it's it's done in a different way and so it 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 doesn't count towards our, our debt ceiling limits per se because there's funding coming back uh, to it. But to go to an 80% increase in one year is quite extensive, and, and that's the reason why I'm, I'm at this point recommending uh, us going from $5 billion to $7 billion the way exactly the way the House had it. Uh, response from Chair Howard. Uh, Chair Hornstein, Representative Petersburg, um, I would uh, urge a no vote and just want to talk a little bit about why we're doing this. And, and to, to level set, and we had this discussion in committee, but you know the Minnesota Housing Finance Agency is a little different than other state agencies. Uh, it, it's a bank in, in, a, in a large way, and they use uh, their ability as a bank to finance uh, homes and to create more homeowners, a shared goal that I think all of us uh, share, creating more homeowners, reducing our racial uh, gap in home ownership. And so uh, th these aren't general obligation bonds. They're bonds backed um, you know, by the folks that are uh, paying them off their mortgage. And so if we want to uh, create more homeowners in Minnesota, uh, this is an avenue to do so. Um, and I think, you know, it's been many, many years. I don't have it right in front of me how long we've raised this before. But I don't think it's appropriate for us to just have become Congress and have year after year political fights um, when we know this is a, a way that we're, is working well to create more homeowners. And so I think it's appropriate and allows us uh, to meet a goal that all of us share, which is creating more homeowners in the state of Minnesota. Thank you. Did you want uh, to the maker of the... Amendment and motion. Did you want to have a final comment before we vote? Uh, yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and, and I do understand that. I, I understand that we want want to do that. But this is a quite a large uh, increase. You know, if if we had done, you know, half of it 
this biennium and half of it, the next half, the next biennium, that'd be one thing. But to expand this expansion to this level, uh, when we don't even have the homes out there yet uh, in inventory in order to buy, uh, just seems like we are being a, a little bit short-sighted in, in what the potential are into the future. And, and I still believe that as much as we don't want to have these political fights, uh, as you said, it is important for us to do that. That, that is what we're elected to do. We're, we're not elected to be just a rubber stamp and just pass things through without debate and without concern. If, if it's not something that can be reinforced and sold to the legislature, then we ought not to do it. And one legislature doing this to another is, uh, is not the correct way for us to do it, I don't think. So again, I would reiterate that a 40% increase in the debt ceiling is is quite large and should be sufficient over the next at least sing, single biennium. Uh, thank you. And uh, Chair Port will weigh in. Thank you, Chair Hornstein. Uh, I, one thing I would just like to add to this conversation is uh, oh, last year when we were talking, when Chair Howard and I were advocating for uh, a significant investment in housing. Chair Howard carried around a gallon of water and a tablespoon. And that tablespoon was the amount of investment out of that gallon of water that housing had gotten in accordance with the state's budget. We have been wildly underfunding housing for decades wildly. This last year, this last biennium, is the first year in the history of the state where we took a step big enough to actually say, we're taking this seriously. We're making a concerted effort with a billion dollars. And members, it is a drop in the bucket compared to the need across our state. I think that this increase in capacity actually looks at the need of what Minnesotans will have for years to come and is planning now to make the investments that we know will be necessary to close the home ownership gap, that we are the second worst state in the country for racial home ownership gap. We can close that, but we need to build houses. We need to build home ownership opportunities. That's exactly what this does. Communities all across Minnesota needs, a, needs it, and it sets us up for years to come. I urge members to vote this amendment down. Thank you, Chair Port. Is there any further discussion of the A2129? Last word, Representative Petersburg. Uh, thank you. I, I would just make sure we understand in comparison the $1 billion in, in tax, uh, sales tax last year, plus this $4 billion uh, makes it $5 billion. That's almost 10% of the entire state biennial budget. That's a huge increase. And so to say that we're, we're not doing a, a lot of dollars is, is not necessarily true. Um, there may be more need for that, but you know what? Um, there will always be more need. Uh, there, it just is. So we have to do what we can realistically in respect to all the rest of what the state has to be responsible for as well. So again, I would urge a yes vote on the amendment. And I am correcting myself. We already acted on the A129. This is the Petersburg oral amendment that is before us. And um, maybe if we could have um, someone from the nonpartisan staff just repeat the uh, oral amendment and then everyone can be clear and then we'll take a vote. Uh, Mr. Chair, members, Justin Cope, House Research. As I understand Representative Peterberg's amendment, it would be on uh, page 17, line 6 of the A24-0342 amendment to delete $9 billion and insert $7 billion. And the effect of that would be reducing the amount by which this is uh, increasing the agency general obligation debt limit from Nine billion to seven billion. Correct. Okay. Members, everyone clear then on this? All in favor of the Petersburg oral amendment, uh, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? No. No. The motion does not prevail. Uh, is there any other, are, are there any other amendments? 
that members would like to offer that are not in the packet. Okay. Um, further discussion on the work, the housing article in our uh, conference committee report on House File 5242. Okay, do you have a motion, uh, Chair Howard? Yes, Chair Hornstein. I would move. I would move the A twenty four zero three four two as amended. Can okay. I urge members to vote yes. And uh, further discussion, Chair uh, Dibble. I would just suggest that uh, Chair Howard add to his motion, uh, giving permission to staff to make technical changes. So moved. <laughs> the voice of experience to my left. Okay, uh, I don't see, uh, see any further discussion. We have the motion to adopt the A24-0342 amendment uh, <coughs> as amended. Uh, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? No. The motion prevails. So. Then this, yes, we, uh, Chair Dibble has indicated that uh, that is part of the motion. Uh, and uh, the, the staff will make technical corrections. Um, so we have a housing article. Thank you very much to our housing team, both sides of the aisle, staff on both sides of the aisle for um, their hard work on this. Um, before we uh, adjourn, I wanted to just ask um, Chair Nelson, um, for maybe an update on, and I understand you've made significant progress. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Um, yeah, we've got, we've made progress. We've got, I think by tomorrow we'll be able to wrap up the, the labor section of the bill and uh, um, just getting, making sure language is right and better to get, do it once and get it right than, than rush it and possibly have, have mistakes made. Uh, thank you very much for that update. So, members, um, here is our update from transportation. Uh, we are also making a lot of progress, and we anticipate also at some point tomorrow uh, we'll be able to wrap up. And uh, so tomorrow, um, please keep uh, an eye on your... Uh, emails. Um, we are going to start at 9 a.m. We're adjourning for the uh, duration for the evening tonight now, but we're going to start at 9 a.m. in the Senate building, Minnesota Senate building, MSB 1150. MSB 1150 tomorrow at 9 a.m. I would anticipate uh, we'll start with labor and then we'll move on to uh, transportation from there. So that's the plan. Uh, we might have a few stops and starts tomorrow because there is session, uh, but we hope to get as much done as we can uh, tomorrow at 9 up to 11 o'clock when I know there's a House floor session. When is the Senate uh, meeting tomorrow? Uh, Mr. Chair, we're in, 11, we're in at 11, but we have caucus. Okay, so hopefully we're done in the morning tomorrow. Uh, is there any, anyone else have any further questions or comments before we adjourn? Okay, well thanks everybody uh, for your work. Oh, sure. oh. Chair Dibble. I just wanted to convey my uh, thanks and regards to the housing folks. Uh, great, great work. Um, and uh, congratulations on getting the article wrapped up, which means now uh, we're off to the reviser and our documents is uh, starting to be created. Um, which is great, uh, and it, it is a, a fine package of work, and I know everyone put a lot into this, so I really appreciate it. Chair Howard. Chair Deborah Hornstein, does housing win anything for wrapping its bill up first between transportation and... Yeah, okay, pat on the back. To be determined. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But no, I, I, I echo Chair Dibble's uh, just deep appreciation for both chairs, Chair Ford and Chair Howard, for your work, and again, the incredible, incredible effort of all of our partisan and nonpartisan staff to getting us to this place. So uh, with that, we are adjourned.